Thank you, Marshall. Boy, imagine being a junior hire and getting to spend all of your Wednesday nights with that guy. Wouldn't that be something? That's pretty, that's pretty cool right there. I'm not saying it'd be worth going back to junior high for, <laughs> but if you happen to be there already, that's a pretty cool thing for, for our kids. Um, yeah, hi, good to see everybody, uh, whether you're here. Um, I'm not sure if there's, yeah, there's a few people outside. Hi, I see you as the door opens. Wave, I see you, yes. Well, I see you too, but I was looking at the people out there. But yeah, hi. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, wave to me if you're uh, online right now. <laughs> Are you actually doing it, I wonder? Uh, anyway, we're glad that you're uh, tuning in with us as well. Um, yeah, we got a good uh, time in the Word prepared. Um, and you're going to need a Bible today. So if you don't have one, uh, please don't be shy. Put up your hand. Our greeters will give you a Bible to use today because there's a nice long passage that we're going to read through. I think it would be easier for you to be able to just kind of read through on your own. So even if you don't normally pick up a Bible, put up your hand. And I'll even tell you the page number. It's uh, 918, 918. If you can start turning there. Um, it's going to be Acts chapter 10. So if you're new with us, if you're a guest here at the bridge, I want to just let you know that we have been going through a, an extended series. This is going to be, a, has been a few months, and it'll be many more months still, where we're walking through uh, the book of Acts. So it's a wonderful book. It tells us about the beginnings and the growth of the church as it begins in Jerusalem and now is expanding throughout the known world. And today's passage is, uh, is kind of fun because we're going to get a little bit into theology. It really brings out a, a deep, important theological point. So just a quick little thing on theology, in case you're not really sure about that word. Theology simply means, just boil it down, to its base meaning, it simply means the study of God. Theology. So theos, God, and then ology is the study of, like biology, the study of life, bios. Um, and so theology is the study of God. Really, the entire Bible is about theology. Um, and every book of the Bible uh, seems to handle... Uh, or approach theology in slightly different ways. For instance, when we look at Paul's epistles or his letters that he writes to the churches, like Colossians and Ephesians and Philippians, those tend to be really focused on teaching uh, deep theological truths. So when we think of Romans, for instance, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is Paul teaching the church these deep, rich theological truths. But when we get to Luke's writings, it's a little bit different in both of his volumes. Volume 1, uh, the self-titled Gospel of Luke um, that is talking about Jesus and his ministry. And then when we get to Acts, the second volume, talking about the church and the expansion of the church, it takes more of a narrative form. And so this is Luke basically telling the historical story of Jesus in his first volume and of the church and the Holy Spirit coming and everything else in the second volume. But while Luke is not expressly teaching theology necessarily, his narrative demonstrates theology being lived out. So in the narrative, we see these deep, wonderful theological truths actually being lived out in real time by the people that we're interacting with in these stories. So it's not as much hey, let me teach you about this really important theological truth. That's more what Paul is doing. But Luke here in the Acts is more telling these historical, real stories of people who are 
discovering and entering into the theological truths themselves. So here's the way, you know, here's people interacting with God, and here's how God responds, that kind of thing. Okay, does that make sense? So the passage that we're going to look at today is a really, really good example of exactly what I was talking about. So I'm actually going to invite Marshall to come on back, and uh, he's really going to earn his keep today. <laughs> um, he does actually get paid, like he says, yeah. but it's interesting to know that you would actually pay to do this. We will take that into consideration. Uh, <laughs> no, no, he's well worth everything that he gets, for sure. But um, I want you to follow along as he reads this extended passage. He's going to read the entire chapter uh, uh, of chapter 10. So get comfortable, but follow along and listen carefully for some theological truths that are coming out in the story that he's going to be reading about. Okay? So check this out. You ready? Buckle up. All right. Verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who's, who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as, as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he, began, he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came to a came a voice to him rise Peter kill and eat but Peter said by no means Lord for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean and the voice came to him again a second time what God has made clean do not call common this happened three times and the thing was taken up at once to heaven now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation. For I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guest. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone from another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I ask then why you, have, why you sent for me. Verse 30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. 
And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are all, and we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of, of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Thank you, Marshall. So, <clears throat> pretty amazing passage. Um, I hope you were picking up some really interesting things. Let's just dive in and take a closer look Together. So we start out by being introduced to the main character. His name is Cornelius in verse 1. Uh, he's quite the guy. It says he is a devout man, meaning he is religious, pious. Uh, he's a God-fearing man, meaning he definitely acknowledges God and wants to honor him. Uh, he, gave, he gives alms generously, which is giving your money to uh, the poor and the needy. And he prayed continually to God, which... Kind of speaks for itself that's um, quite a compliment as well so this guy Cornelius he must be a Christian right I mean it certainly sounds like it and well if he's not a Christian then he's got to be one of those really devout Jewish followers of God right it's got to be one of those but of course we find out that he is neither he is neither he is not yet a Christian and he's Definitely not Jewish. He is Roman. He's a Roman centurion. So he's a commander of the army um, of the Romans who are there occupying the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, um, in this land. So very clearly, Cornelius is a Gentile. A Gentile simply means a non-Jew, a non-Jewish person. So... Um, I, I'm sure we have a few Jewish people that are here today, but for the most of us, we are something other than Jewish, and so uh, we are Gentiles for the most part. So you may not have known that coming in, that you're a Gentile, but now you know. You're leaving knowing you're now a Gentile, and you can tell all your friends about it, and I'm sure they'll be thrilled for you. Uh, <laughs> Now, it's important to note historically, what was the relationship between the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people or the Gentiles, people from other nations? What was that relationship? Well, they shared space. 
they lived in the same land, but that's about all that they had in common. Because according to the Jewish law, the Jewish people weren't to interact with um, the Gentiles. In fact, Peter says in the story a little bit later in verse 28, Peter says it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit with anyone of another nation. So, pretty important background information for what's about to take place. In addition to that Jewish history, so far the good news of Jesus had only gone to the Jewish people. So, if you remember when the church first started, the Holy Spirit came for the first time at what we call Pentecost. It happened in Jerusalem, and so it was only Jewish believers that were there receiving the Holy Spirit, hearing the good news of Jesus. And so, so far, they were the only ones that had heard. Now, Peter, though, was going outside of Jerusalem to take the good news of Jesus and to spread the church beyond just those in Jerusalem. But even as he did that, it was initially unclear who he was going to because maybe he's just going to go and tell other Jewish people who didn't happen to live in Jerusalem because the Jews lived, you know, all over the place, were scattered in a lot of different locations. So maybe he's just going to tell them. Or could it be that it's time for the Gentiles to be included as well? This is what we're going to find out in this story because here is this Gentile Cornelius and the question for him is is he going to get a chance is he going to have an opportunity to hear about the gospel the good news of Jesus and become part of his church become a follower of Jesus well amazingly God decides to send an angel messenger to this Gentile Cornelius he shows up and the angel tells him that God has heard his prayers that he's seen his good works. And so he's made a decision to send someone to tell him a little bit more. He says, I'm going to send to you Peter, my servant, and he is going to tell you more of what you need to know about me. It's still a little mysterious as to what he's going to find out, but that's the message um, from this angel. Now, that doesn't happen a lot, does it? I don't know if any of you have ever... Uh, had an angel show up to give you a message from God if if that has happened to you Then I would love to hear that story because it sounds like That that would that would be interesting to know because I just haven't heard a lot of stories like that at least Here in North America. I haven't But I'm not sure if you realized but in other parts of the country other parts of the world. I mean um, God seems to still do this kind of thing. So anecdotally, as I've had a chance to travel to a few locations in the world that are predominantly Muslim nations, like Iraq and Turkey, I have heard these stories of an angel visitation or Jesus showing up in a dream or a vision. In fact, one of my friends who is a, uh, a Christian leader there in that region, he tells me stories of how he goes out into the streets, into the public areas, and he'll just come up to someone randomly, and he'll ask, hey, have you seen the man in the bright white robe? And if they look at him kind of funny, like, what? What? Then he'll say, um, never mind, and he'll move on. And he'll go to the next person, and he'll say, hey, have you seen the man in the bright white robe? And eventually he'll come across someone who says, yes, the man in the bright white robe showed up in one of my dreams. And my friend is able to tell them, hey, I've been sent by God to tell you that that person is Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Like, I kind of get chills, again, just telling that story, that, that that happens, that God still does that. Again, not really as much 
don't hear those stories a lot in North America for whatever reason. You, uh, I have maybe a few reasons why God chooses not to work in that way here. Maybe you have some thoughts on that too, but um, anyway, it's just cool to think that he still does, but that's exactly what happens here. So as we get back to the story, the story now cuts to a different scene, and we're, we're shown Peter. Peter now is in a place called Joppa, and it is 35 miles south, just down the coastline from where Cornelius is in Caesarea, about 35 miles. Peter is praying one day on the top of a house, and he, I guess he's praying, have you, has this happened to you? You pray so long you get hungry? I don't know how many of us have that kind of prayer life where we pray so long that we, we uh, you know, get hungry, but that's what happens with Peter. He gets hungry. He actually falls asleep or falls into a trance, and he's getting this vision. So he's getting a vision from God as well, and his vision is of a picnic of sorts. That's what I call it, at least, a picnic. But, but it says that a... Uh, a great white sheet is let down from heaven and it's held by like the four corners um, and somehow this in his vision uh, in his dream is just let down and on the white sheet is all kinds of animals like I think a, a representation of every kind of animal is on that sheet and with the vision comes an audible as well. He audibly hears this voice from heaven that says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. I love that part of the vision. Don't you, especially guys, all right? Kill and eat. Yeah. <laughs> all of our meat lovers, right? We love that. Kill and eat. But Peter comes up with an objection. He says, No way. Is this some sort of trick? You know, he might be wondering, like, I'm not going to do that. God, you have restricted what we as devout Jews are supposed to eat. And there's some th things that are clean, some things that are unclean. And I've never eaten that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm not going to start now. That's Peter's objection. But God responds to his objections and says, uh, Peter, pay attention now. Some things have changed. Some things have changed. Yes, it is true that um, God had set up some eating restrictions, some food restrictions, and you can look those up if you're curious to see what did God allow, what didn't he allow, uh, but you can look that up in Leviticus chapter 11. But now God responds to his objection, and he says, no, things have changed. And then in verse 15, it says, what God has made clean, do not call common. What God has made clean, do not call common. I don't want to get too caught up here because this is not necessarily the major point that we're looking at, but in Jewish law, God had these food restrictions for his people, but we find out that the reason for the food restrictions was not because they were somehow like non-edible and like somehow inherently bad for you if you eat these things. No, that's not the reason. The reason for the few food restrictions was simply that Israel would be set apart from other nations. God had several things in mind that would set Israel apart from other nations. But now that Jesus has come, he has done away with those Jewish Distinctives. They're no longer needed now that Jesus has come. In fact, one point, at one point, Jesus himself says in Mark chapter 7, we'll put that up on the screen for you. It says, <clears throat> Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and then is expelled? Thus, he declared all foods clean. So Jesus is actually making a, a, a larger point in, in Mark 5, but the point is he has now declared that for Christians, for the church of today, you know, back when it first started 
2,000 years ago and for today, all food is available to be eaten, is clean, and you can eat everything, including bacon. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Who doesn't just have their mouth start watering just at the mention of bacon? And that was one of the restrictions, right? Pork. How about, um, how about crab and lobster? Any crab and lobster fans? Oh, I love that stuff. Well, you can be glad that Jesus has come and you live in the church age because you can eat that stuff. Um, the Jewish people before that, that was a no-no. So just another thing to go home and praise God for today as you open up your bacon. Have your bacon burger. All right. So back to Peter in the story. Verse 17 tells us that he's a little perplexed. As he sees this vision, he doesn't quite understand the meaning yet. He knows that it's got to be something more than just about animals, but he can't quite put his finger on it yet. Well, that's the point in the story where the messengers from Cornelius show up, and they explain to Peter all that happened with the angel showing up and saying, hey, I'm going to send Peter to you. And uh, so Peter understands, he agrees, and they take the journey from Joppa, the 35 miles back up to Caesarea. So you can imagine uh, they were walking at that time. And so this is a full day's journey. And Peter had a lot of time on his hands. And it doesn't tell us specifically what was happening. It often doesn't. You know, it just says, and then they traveled from there to there, and we're left to our imaginations to, to, you know, I wonder what happened during that journey. But one thing that we can be pretty sure that was happening on this particular journey is that Peter had some time with God to be asking him, hey, about that vision, like, what's going on there? And I think it's pretty clear that God had some discussions with him about that, because by the time he arrived the next day in Caesarea to meet Cornelius— it was clear that Peter had figured it out. He understood what the vision with the sheet and the animals was all about. Look at uh, verse 28. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Imagine how receiving that message, how crazy that was in light of history and what has gone on. This is a gigantic theological truth that they're bumping into here. Peter gets even more clear as he explains it in verse 34 and 35. So Peter opened his mouth and said, whenever it says, whenever that phrase is Peter, like he opened his mouth and said, we should really take note of what he's saying because that's a point of emphasis. It's not like sometimes he opens his mouth to talk, but other times he doesn't open his mouth to talk, like a ventriloquist or something, you know? No, he always opens his mouth, but when it says he opened his mouth and then he said this, then we should especially pay attention. It's important what he's saying. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Wow. If you were living at that time, especially as a Jewish believer, let's say, I mean, your mind is blown. I'm calling this the revolutionary revelation that the gospel is for everyone. Amen? The gospel is for everyone, not just the Jew, but also for the Gentile as well. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your religious background is. It doesn't matter what you currently believe. It doesn't even matter if you consider yourself an atheist right now. It doesn't change the fact that the good news of Jesus bringing salvation to the world 
is for everyone. It's for, for everyone everywhere. What a beautiful truth that is. Now, chronologically speaking, chronologically speaking, this isn't the first time that we discover this theological truth, that salvation is not just for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. Jesus, when he was living a few years ago, before, a few years before this, um, he prophesied about this um, when, ironically, he was actually speaking to a different Roman centurion at the time, and Jesus was so impressed by this guy's faith, listen to what he said in Matthew 8. Truly I tell you, there's another hint, by the way, when it's truly I tell you, we should really, really pay attention. No one, with no one in Israel, have I found such faith. That's quite a statement, isn't it? I tell you, many will come from east and from west, To recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This was huge. This is Jesus prophesying this theological truth that Gentiles as well as Jews will enter into the kingdom of God, will become part of God's family and be saved. And aren't you glad of that? I mean, where are my Gentiles at? (laughs) Most of us here are Gentiles, right? Aren't you glad that God's plan was not just for his chosen people, Israel, but was for everybody everywhere, Gentiles as well, us included, Americans, Canadians, and Americans. (laughs) I sort of consider myself American, even though some of you may not know I'm I'm actually Canadian, but no one really cares about that. Uh, (laughs) In light of this, right? Uh, I mean, even if we, even if we go right back to the beginning, when God was first choosing Abraham and deciding that he was going to create a people for himself, a nation for himself, even back then, it was very clear that that decision was not an end of itself, but towards a greater mean, no, end, something like that. Listen to Genesis chapter 22. I will surely bless you, Abraham, God says, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and of the sand that is on the seashore. So I'm going to make you a huge nation. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring, here it is, in your offspring shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Because you have obeyed my voice. So even as God is promising Abraham that this great nation of Israel will come for you, even back then in the very beginning, God was saying, but don't miss that my purpose for choosing you and creating this nation is that so that through you, I can bless all people from all nations. And of course, God accomplished it how? Through Abraham's divine offspring. Anybody know who that was? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right? Who we celebrated his birth just a month ago or so. Praise God. And right here in the passage that we look at today, that beautiful truth is actually being lived out. It's coming to fruition right here before our eyes. Later, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is going to pick up on this truth that it's not just for the Jew, but also for the Gentile, and he's really going to solidify that in our minds um, and to the church. He's going to pretty much almost every letter in some way, Paul is going to reiterate this truth. I just want to give you one example. In the book of Galatians, the letter to the people, the, the Galatian church, Um, In chapter 3, it says, Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's no more differentiation. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. That's amazing. He's saying that in Christ, God's people are no longer defined by bloodlines. 
but instead by the shed blood of Christ, which is shed for everybody everywhere. Are you grateful for that today? That God has given everybody, even us, an opportunity to know the good news of Jesus and to accept him by faith and to be brought into the family of God, which includes Jews and Gentiles all around the world. Just one more point that I would like to make um, from this passage before we get into um, a, a worship song that's just going to blow your minds. Man, I just love this next song. I can't wait. But at the beginning of the story, if you remember, Cornelius was being described as a really nice guy, right? I mean, it was an amazing description. He's a, he, he was well spoken of by the whole Jewish community. Really? Like, the whole Jewish community? There wasn't just one guy who said, eh, I'm not crazy about him, you know. But, I mean, maybe a little exaggeration here, but the whole Jewish community is speaking well of him. He's a God-fearing man. He generously gives his money away to those that are in need, and he prays continually to God. Wouldn't you love it if someone described you that way? Like, if someone said those things about you, like, I'd be like, oh, that's a really nice description. I'm not sure it's all true, but that's really nice of you to say. That's the beautiful thing that they were saying about this Cornelius. But the question is, was that enough? Was being the nicest guy and the most moral guy and the most religious guy on the block, is that enough? And the answer that we see all throughout the Bible is very clearly, no, it is not enough. It is not enough. No one gets saved by being a nice person and being a moral person and being a religious person. There's always something missing. Why? Well, because being a nice person and a moral person and a religious person can't make you right before God. Because if you mess up just one little time, just one little, even if it's just one little sin, and I know the truth is for all of us, it's a lot more than one little sin, but even if it were just one little sin, it would disqualify you from being a part of the family of God and having a relationship with God. Why? Because God is a perfect, holy God, can have nothing to do with sin. All sin, all sin must be punished. And the Bible says that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, God's glorious standard of perfection. Nobody gets over that bar on their own. That's why there's one thing needed. Cornelius, it wasn't enough that you're the best man around. There was one thing that was needed, one thing that was required, and that one thing was a savior. That's what was missing. That's what he needed. That's why he needed to hear the good news about Jesus. Because he needed a savior. He needed someone to stand in his place, to take the punishment of his sin, and to be taken by the hand, and to be led by his savior, who lived a perfect life into the presence of God, having been clothed with our savior's righteousness, not our own. We didn't really look too closely at these verses, but verse 36 through 43, I encourage you to Read through those again sometime on your own. It is a beautiful presentation of the gospel message, of the good news of Jesus. And at the end of it, Peter says this, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Isn't that a beautiful summary of the gospel? That everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And as you're reading through, at that point, something happens. Wham! The Holy Spirit falls on all these people that are hearing that truth for the first time. I call it the, the Gentiles get a little taste of the, the Pentecost as well, right? Because that was what was missing. He was a great guy and everything, but he needed a Savior. And when he heard and believed the truth about his Savior, Jesus, wham, the Holy Spirit fell on those people as they believed, and they were never the same again. God's presence indwelt them. Here's the thing. I don't know 
how much angels still visit us today. I don't know how many times Jesus actually shows up in people's dreams, but one thing I do know for certain is that the Holy Spirit continues to fall on people who get on their face before God, repent of their sins, and ask Jesus to save them and to be their Savior. We, we sang the song before we were singing, Oh, come, Holy Spirit, will you fall on this place? Remember those words? What are we singing it for? Because we believe that it is true. And I just want to give an invitation today for anybody that's here or anybody that's watching online, wherever you're at today. If you have not taken that final piece of the puzzle that you've been missing, maybe you've been trying to do it on your own, you've been living a good life, you've been pretty moral, you know, you're coming to church even, you're doing some religious stuff, but there's still something missing and you're realizing you're trying to do it on your own and you're never going to get over that bar on your own. Maybe today you're realizing for the first time, I need a Savior. That's what I need. That's what's missing. I need Jesus. I need Jesus to stand in my place. I need Jesus to take the punishment for my sin as he died on the cross. And when he rose from the dead, I need him to give me his righteousness so I can be ushered into the presence of God, have a relationship with him and for, for now and also for eternity in heaven. My friend, if you pray a prayer like that and receive Jesus as your Savior and believe those truths, guess what's going to happen? Holy Spirit is going to fall on you just like that, and instantly you're going to be changed. Amen? It's never going to be the same again. And so the band's just going to continue playing a little instrumental here, and I'm not going to do anything sort of big and um, showy is the wrong word, but, you know, I'm not going to invite you to stand or come forward or anything like that today. I just feel led to invite you to say a prayer just between you and God. You've heard the truth. You already know what to do. To just pray and give your heart over to Jesus. Receive him as your savior. Because I want the Holy Spirit to fall on people in this place today. Or wherever you're at, listening, watching online. So we're just going to take a minute. The band's going to play. Please. Pray, receive Jesus as your Savior today. If you've already done it, please be praying for those that God is tapping on the shoulder and saying, hey, that's you today. Pray that they will humble themselves and get over the line as they receive Jesus as their Savior today. So let's just take a minute and pray.